Hello, sports fans. We have a great episode of uh, Fetching with Adam and Jared tonight. Uh, we have uh, three different stories that are sports related. So for those of you that are into that sort of thing, this is going to be very exciting for you. So Jared, what are those uh, stories that we're going to talk about? Well, before I mention that, I should add that, you know, this is an important topic, Jews and sports. I mean, we've all seen the movie Airplane, uh, that very short piece of re reading literature they got on the plane. What was it? Famous Jewish athletes? Uh, yes. Yes. You know, yes. Three pages long. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, uh, hang on a second. I have here, now that you mention it, I have my, my little statuette here of uh, Sandy Koufax. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Yeah. I got the, this was free. Mm -hmm. I got this uh, as a giveaway at uh, Dodger Stadium at a game many years ago. I actually had a baseball signed by the entire uh, Montreal Expos either 1984, I think it was either 84, 85, 83 or 84, which, you know, was their heyday, you know, Andre Dawson and Gary Carter and all those people. And I yeah. don't know what happened to it. It's got to be worth money at this point. What but, does that have to do with it? With what? With the topic. Nothing. What does your Sandy Koufax thing have to do with Because that? he's Jewish. I'm also Jewish. What the hell? Yeah, but the but the at Montreal Expos, uh, Andre Dawson wasn't Jewish, or was he? Well, you got to look into it, but I don't think he was. I don't uh, think No, so. I will add what has to do with the topic. My, my colleague a, a few, about a month ago, came to my office and to give me a book, uh, and it was called The Jewish Athlete in American History. And he made it the point out that it said athletes and not athletes, i.e. there was uh. only one of them. Uh -huh. okay, so we're going to talk about sports. I am not a sports person whatsoever. The only reason I knew who was in the Super Bowl this year is because my students told me. I normally see if I could go until the end of it without actually knowing. I was under the impression Taylor Swift was the halftime show. And then someone told me that it was something named Usher. I found that out by doing a crossword puzzle. And I still have no idea to this day who Usher is. Um, apparently yeah, but you might, you, you say you're not a sports person, but as a Canadian, you must have played hockey. I As never a, played hockey. I was very bad at sports. You're the only Canadian I have ever met. I'm that, terrible at team sports. I was always picked last in baseball all the time. I'm very athletic in terms of doing, you know, singular things. But no, I've never been good at team sports whatsoever. I, um, yeah, I enjoyed playing basketball with friends, but I was not any good at it. Um, in terms of hockey, no, I wasn't a good skater. I did skate, but no, nothing, nothing special. Um, I am a Montreal Canadiens fan if and when they make the playoffs. So once every 10 years or so, I start to tune in. Okay. Uh, but well, back in the 80s... This. Have you ever been to a CFL game? No, I haven't. Right. No, I have, I've never been to a football game until I went to one of my son's uh, high school about a month or two ago. I see. Okay. Yeah, no, I have not been to a CFL game. I know Kramer only watches Canadian football, so I should aspire to do that. I before. have been to a CFL game. Why? No. Oh. Because I was living in Vancouver at the time. Oh, was there a team? The, I saw the BC Lions oh, versus yeah. the Edmonton Eskimos. Oh, yeah. the Edmonton, now, they're, Ed, they're not the Eskimos anymore. Now. Gonna, but that's what I was about to ask. What are they now? They're the Elks now. They're the Elks? Elks, yeah. Why didn't they just go with the Inuits? I have well because the whole point was to not be called uh, call themselves after a native uh, tribe. Oh, I thought it was that it was an offensive uh, term for a tribe. Wait a sec, but wasn't the weren't the Chiefs just in the Super Bowl? Yeah, but they haven't changed their name. I know that. That's there, there are there 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 is a movement to get them to change their name. Oh, okay. Well, but that, that's pretty yeah. Weird. Yeah. Anyway, we should probably uh yeah, yeah, absolutely. These, uh, these sports stories. Okay. That, well, yeah. the first one is just, you know, a little uh I'm going to turn on screen share here. And uh, the first one of course just has to do with a, a personal favorite uh, of mine. Um, a favorite uh, person we commonly refer to as the twerp uh, TM, just because he made some Super Bowl related announcements on Twitter uh, the other day. And we know what a great sports fan um, he is, apparently. So let me hit screen share and I shall turn on the screen over here. And here we go. Well, it seems as if Sasha Sendorovich uh, tweeted um, on Sunday. Intense bombardment of Rafa reported a bit after 7 p.m. ET, timed, I have little doubt, precisely to the scheduled mass American distraction called the Super Bowl. Huh. Yeah, he did, is he being serious? Is he really Someone's got Super Bowl fever, apparently. Um, and uh, and it's Sasha. Um, yeah, that's that's exactly what was going on, for sure. Yeah. Is it does, he really, does he really seriously think 
that uh, that that the IDF bombarded the the border crossing uh, at that particular time just because the Super Bowl was coming on. I don't think the IDF really thinks about the Super Bowl, to be perfectly honest with you. And to be honest, this is really a very ethnocentric American position to take, which is one of the great ironies with the woke. They think that their framework for explaining the world applies to every other country. How many Israelis do you really think even knew that their Super Bowl was taking place? Given that soccer um, is so prevalent uh, and people are so obsessed with it in the rest of the world, I don't think they watch American football or my sense from traveling abroad is that the rest of the world doesn't really have much respect for American football and no. that includes rugby players. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I think this tweet's a little bit insane. It gave me a good laugh um, until the next morning. And then it gave me even more of a laugh. I, I saw the newspaper headlines. And uh, here we have one example of it right here. IDF rescues two hostages from South Gaza's Rafa in daring nighttime operation. Perhaps this had less to do with the Super Bowl and more to do with the fact that the IDF got good uh, intelligence on hostages being kept at Rafa and planned it out to rescue them, much as the United States planned out the assassination of Osama bin Laden once they had verifiable data. Now, now did Sasha Sindorovic uh, tweet, because you follow his Twitter feed, I don't, did he... Uh, acknowledge it at all that the Israelis uh, rescued two hostages? I don't, well, first of all, I don't really follow him. I, I tune in there for a good laugh every couple of days, oh. but, but I, I have not seen anything. Uh, I, I did, I think I looked at his Twitter feed maybe this morning, uh, but I don't know if I scrolled all the way back to Sunday. If there was something, and because this is what I've seen on the rest of the uh, the left's uh, feed, you know, basically saying, but they killed 67 Palestinians. That's not justice, right? It's not reasonable to kill other people to rescue Israeli hostages. And Jews are saying this. So um, we could get into a whole morality debate about what's legitimate in warfare and what's not legitimate. But um, you are going to have casualties in war, especially if the people in the house who get killed are holding hostages. They are no longer civilians at that point. Mm -hmm. If Hamas could decide yeah. every single Israeli is not a civilian because they are, quote, settlers, then Palestinians who actually hold hostage, Jews, Israelis, can't be considered civilians. So the way I see it, it's a military oct um, operation, a legitimate one. Mazel tov to the IDF. Every hostage uh, that you save counts. It was either Hillel or Rabbi Akiva said something about every life that you save, uh, you know, as if you saved the entire world. Well, the IDF saved the world twice in this case. I know that's quoted in Curb Your Enthusiasm when Larry saves that guy from drowning um, during a baptism. But uh, yeah, that, that's 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 where I know the quote from. Is this going to go into your sequel to the uh, the the Babel, the the Seinfeld Talmud? I haven't completely decided whether I'm writing one yet. I have to feel the inspiration, and that hasn't happened right. yet. Well, wait till season twelve ends, which I haven't watched yet. Right. Uh, we'll yeah. see what turns out. So that's our little entry story. Sasha's Super Bowl fever. Let me ask this: uh, so so we don't know if he was being serious or not. Oh, I think he's being serious, one hundred percent. All yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and Sasha it's... doesn't have a sense of humor. Um, you know, you're not you're not supposed. Well, to... I would like to personally, right now, uh, for the second time, uh, extend an invitation to Sasha to come on Kvetching to answer my question: Are you being serious or not, or are you were you joking? Okay. Well, why don't you tweet it to him because he blocked um, our network's uh, Twitter account, and I'm. All right. I'm like, you know, because I did invite him onto our podcast before. Yeah, and then he threatened you with excommunication. Right, right. Yeah. I never communicated with him in the first place uh, prior to that. Oh, I just, can, you be, can you be excommunicated if you've never actually communicated? That's why I'm saying I don't think I was excommunicated, but he 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 uh, he implicated me. Yeah, and he said you are now implicated. I kept you away from this. Uh, right. And he was doing you a favor. It's, uh, you know. All I did was invite him on the podcast. I wasn't going to... Uh, I wasn't going to argue with him. I was going to basically moderate a discussion between you and him. I told him that I would stay out of it. I'm not even going to engage you. I'll let you and Jared uh, duke it out. Hmm. Uh, well, I might need some support at some point. But sure, I could duke it out with him. That's not a problem. Um, so this is an open invitation to Sasha Sidorovich to come onto our podcast. That is the second open invitation I, I'm going to extend. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, right. we're, we're done with him for now. Let's move on to the bigger stories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know if Sasha watched the Super Bowl. Somehow I doubt it. Um, I remember him dissing football in the past. So it sounds like I'm surprised he was even aware there was a Super Bowl that night. Um, all right. There's a couple of uh, you know big items in the news. Um, one of them is uh, relates to, well, I don't know if this is an item that's in the news, but it's a position being put forth by academics with their foot in their door of sports scholarship. And it's been floating around the past weeks. The Olympics are coming up in 2024 in Paris. I did not know they were in Paris until I actually saw this because I don't follow the Olympics. And um, these two, I believe, scholars, Jules Boykoff is a political scientist and the chair of the political science department or the politics and government department at uh, Pacific University, Oregon. I don't know about the other guy. I haven't looked him up. Um, wrote this article um, condemning uh, both Russia and Israel and stating that they should be excluded from the Olympics in 2024. Um, and in this piece, they try to make their case. So I highlighted some of the good parts, and I think this is worth talking about. And again, let me stress here that I'm not a sports uh, fan in any way, but I can tell from my knowledge of the Olympics and having watched it over the years that they don't seem to exclude people pretty often. Um, I, you know, if they're gonna let Iran and Saudi Arabia into the Olympics if uh, executing gay people, the LGBT community, is not sufficient grounds to not including one I, them, I fail to see why the uh, Israelis should be excluded. Let it be added that Palestinians do have a team, as far as I know. Is that is that correct, Adam? I don't know. I think they did. I looked it up, but I'm going to Google it again very quickly here over here. Mm -hmm. I, I did look it up while I was reading this. Do Palestinians, oh, this is Palestine, I should say. Does Palestine have an Olympic team? Palestine's first Olympic competitor was my age, so they definitely competed starting in 96. Um, they have yet to compete in the Winter Olympics, and no athletes from Palestine have ever won an Olympic medal. That doesn't mean they're not there. Uh, okay, uh, Palestine is represented on the International Olympic Committee by the Palestine Olympic Committee, which has sent teams to compete in each Summer Olympics since 1996 under the IOC country code PLE. Okay, that sounds like they're in the Olympics, near as I can tell. Okay, so let it be said that there's no call here to exclude them because of what Hamas did on uh, on October 7th, even though they are the governing power of one of two integral chunks um, of what would ostensibly or allegedly become a Palestinian state. Mm -hmm. So let's just note that right from the beginning. Uh, I'll also note my objections here, and we're not going to, you know, analyze this because any idiot should know the difference between Russia's invasion of Ukraine and Israel's defensive operation in Gaza post 10-7. There is a world of difference to this uh, for thousands of reasons, and there's no reason why should we should have to get into it. Mm -hmm. So two invasions, one carried out by Russia against Ukraine and the other by Israel against Palestinians, have thrown a spotlight on the double standards of the International Olympic Committee. Okay, so right away they're likening Israel's actions to, the palace, uh, to uh, Russia, an invasion. Even though one was clearly, you know, a defensive act in response to a mass terror operation into a territory that I will add that is not a state, right? It is a contested chunk of land at the moment, for all intents and purposes, in a state of war. And I will also say that, you know, Israel even got, in a manner of speaking, valid vindication from the International Court of Justice, right? They were not told to... Uh, have a ceasefire and peacekeepers were not being sent in there to stop the uh, attacks from yeah. occurring. They, they basically told Israel, uh, keep doing what you're doing, but just be careful that it doesn't escalate into genocidal uh, action. But, you know, they 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 were basically validated, vindicated by the, the International Court of Justice, the Hague. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. No, there, there, it's, it's a, uh, you know, I mean, especially given the way that these uh, international um, organizations generally treated Israel, I was perfectly fine with the outcome um, of that. In fact, if you ask me, and not to go, go into too much of a tangent on that, uh, I think the Israeli government really didn't, they did not react as well as they should have. I, I think they, instead of denouncing the uh, ruling, they should have called it a validation. 
Yeah, well, you know, my feelings on the current Israeli government, and I can be a critic of the current Israeli governments and still be a staunch Zionist. The two are not necessarily related to each other. Well, I mean, I can support the current Israeli government, but still have criticisms of it. I support their right to wage war um, against the Palestinians um, and uh, protect the territorial integrity of the Jewish state, as long as with its security. They are the government, and I will support them in wartime. And I'm not an Israeli citizen, so I don't tell Israelis how to vote. That's not my business. So, okay, we got a problem right there, right, with the whole invasion thing. Um, and it's saying, yeah, here they say it again, territorial integrity. I'm not sure what territorial integrity means as far as the Palestinians go, because there are no international borders here, right? I mean, it, Oslo left it as subject to negotiations. Final borders will be, uh, you know, established. Ukraine, conversely, well, was recognized well, within its borders in 1991. Well, wait a minute. Is, are they talking about Gaza or the West Bank? Um, that's a good question, but presumably it's the war that precipitated this, right? I, because I don't, I don't know if four years ago they raised the same issue or two years ago, if they raised the same issue regarding the Olympics. Um, I'm sure they did with Russia two years ago. Uh, not but, but, yet, but, but the, the violation of territorial integrity, aren't they, are they, they're referring to the, uh, war going on right now, right? I believe so. The nation's resolution nudging the countries to avoid war during the games. And it's, what does that mean, avoid war during the games? War is legitimate except when the games are taking place? Isn't that, you know, elevating the status of sports uh, internationally to a status that it really doesn't deserve to have? Yeah. Yeah. The Olympic Charter. Who the hell gives a shit about the Olympic Charter? It violated the territorial integrity of the National Olympic Committee of Ukraine. Okay, they're only talking about Ukraine in this paragraph. Um, but I think the implication is that it applies to Israel as well. Okay, uh, And note already that they mentioned apartheid South Africa, which is always their go-to. And it's, I think actually, as far as I know, the only state post-World War II, at least, that has been banned uh, from participating in the Olympics. In any oh, yeah. I mean, Hitler, uh, the, the Nazi Germany uh, team, uh, they, the, Nazi, the, the Nazis uh, had athletes at the Olympics. Well, they hosted the Olympics. I mean, they hosted the Olympics. Yeah, right. that, was, that was obviously planned before the Nazis came to power. And I was yeah. actually talking to a colleague about it the other day. They probably wouldn't have gotten the 36 Olympics um, had uh, Hitler already been in power. Obviously, right. it's just speculation, but I would like to think that the world would have done better. Now, the, I circled some very key terms here. And here is another one that we see floating around all the time, asymmetrical warfare. Okay. Now, I don't understand exactly what asymmetrical warfare is, and I looked it up, and I, I, I read about it, and uh, yeah, okay. One it side, means that one side is a lot more powerful than the other. Yeah, I got that much out of it, but I don't understand why that's wrong. Um, I don't know. I don't either. I mean, war is war, right? Yeah. You're supposed to use whatever means you have at your disposal to win the war, especially if the other side has... Uh, launched a war of extermination, which is what uh, Hamas has continuously vowed to do. Or really, um, the Arabs, going back to 1947, um, when the partition resolution was rejected, and their official line was no Jewish state anywhere in Palestine. So, and Israel, if you want to talk about asymmetrical warfare, in the 1948 war, yeah, the Arabs actually had far more power um, than the Israelis did, um, in terms of the numbers, in terms of the states involved. Uh, Israel was subject to an arms blockade. Weapons had to be funneled in by Czechoslovakia. The U.S. And there's other ways that you can see uh, the concept of asymmetrical warfare. Uh, you know, the, the 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 in Gaza, there's there's civilians uh, shielding all of these uh, sensitive sites, uh, making it far more uh, difficult for Israel just to target uh, combatants. So. Uh, you know, it, it, it's asymmetrical in that sense, too, that uh, the Israelis have that problem, but Hamas doesn't have that problem. Yeah, right. They can't, like, they can't be accused. And, you know, when they say attacking civic infrastructure and private residences, well, they're not specific. We've dealt with all this already. Yeah, no, if, 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 you, if you build a, a, a missile repository and launch sites um, under a hospital or uh, at a newspaper office or anything such thing, that is no longer a civilian site, whether the civilians got a say in the matter or not, period. They just found the, the very deep tunnel under the UNRWA 
uh, headquarters there in, in Gaza. Well, then I'm, as far as I'm concerned, the UNRWA is a party to this war. They are militants on yes, this side of As far as I'm concerned, they should be designated a terrorist group. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I, I, this is one of my favorite lines. Israel is literally killing Olympic coaches <laughs> and seizing sports grounds. It's as if anything they want to criticize or attack Israel about, they have to zero in on a particular occupation or, you know, realm of the universe. It's sort of like, you just killed the journalist. Yeah, but he's also a member of the Hamas party and yeah. has not only given them a propagandistic, uh, you know, mouthpiece and spread their lies about the Jewish people. And I will point out that Julius Streicher was executed at Nuremberg, even though he didn't kill a single Jew uh, during the Holocaust. But it was because of his uh, propaganda, his journalistic work. So, I mean, does it matter if the guy's an Olympic coach? Maybe after you're retired from the Olympics, he went and started to work for Hamas. I mean, how do I know who these people are? Uh -huh. And as for seizing sports grounds, well, I mean, again, if you're conducting military operations and you have prisoners of war and you need to sort through people, I, I don't see why a sports ground would be off limits in such a situation. And none of this would even be happening if Hamas did not attack uh, Israel on October 7th and take uh, hundreds of hostages. Absolutely. Not even happening. They're, yeah. they're, they're, uh, their Olympic coaches would be safe and sound right now coaching their sports uh, athletes yeah. in Gaza. If, and again, if, this document's also about Russia, and I will point out that on February 24th, 2022, Russia invaded Ukraine because it claimed, well, it also claimed all that bullshit about the Nazis, but the reason was that Ukraine was veering westward, and second, that Russia believed that much of Ukrainian territory is historically Russian territory and should have never become independent. Now, there is a grain of truth to the historical Russian part, absolutely, but once a state's been independent for um, three decades, um, you don't have the right to turn back the clock. Its borders are recognized. Much as Israel's borders are recognized and the Arab world refused to come to terms to that, um, Iran still hasn't come to terms to that, but it is a UN member in its borders. And it was once 1967 happened. Um, so this last line here, doing the bidding of the United States, um, which means uh, bending over backward for Israel. Okay, they're talking about the IOC here. Uh, problem here? Does the U.S. do the bidding well, of the United States? Are they, are they saying that the United States should also be uh, banned from the Olympics? No, I think they're actually either saying that uh, the United States controls the Olympics. The United States controls the Olympics, but Israel controls the United States. I think that's what they're saying here, right? If the if Israel if the United States is doing uh, the bidding of Israel, bending over backwards to please it, that implies Israeli control of the American government. For whatever reason, um, not that they gave a reason. Oh, that that is uh, that's that is anti-Semitism. It is anti-Semitism. It's dual loyalty, and they're throwing the damn Olympics into it. They're controlling it's sports. Not just, it's not just dual loyalty. It's saying that that Israel controls the United States. Right. Okay. It's protocols. It's protocol shit. It's oh. Wilhelm Marr, which I just taught my class the other day. Mm -hmm. All right. The Jews, Jewish supremacy, is dictating what happens in the United States. Right. I mean. Uh, I'm surprised Sasha didn't tweet that Israel told the U.S. to have the Super Bowl on the day that it did, because Israel controls the United States. The authors of this article might as well do like that cartoon of the of the puppet, the marionettes, yeah, you know, with uh, Olympic figures as the puppets. Well, Jules Bikoff, Boykoff, you're an idiot, okay? And uh, uh, or this is and an anti semite or the octopus, you know? Yeah. yeah, he is essentially drawing a cartoon of the octopus. And he's also implicating sports. Now, I want to underscore something here about sports, despite my lack of knowledge of sports. If you are suggested to be controlling sports, especially in the U.S., it is essentially apposite. I've always wanted to use that word in a sentence uh, to to controlling the world. Um, after all, the Jews were accused and technically a Jew did play a role in fixing the World Series in what year is it? Do you know, Adam? 1919? You mean the Black Sox? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the Jews, there was a, Jewish gangsters did play a role in that. And mm -hmm. that Semites do often deploy that to show that they're controlling the great American pastime. Look at that. If they could actually, you know, rig um, the uh, great uh, baseball finals, then they must be controlling the world. Okay, so this is really abhorrent, right? There's no explanation for why the U.S. would be bending over backwards 
to pleasing Israel. And then what about Russia, right? The U.S. is certainly not bending over backwards to please Russia, leaving Donald Trump aside for the moment. Um, they're certainly not doing that at the moment. Uh, insist on the autonomy of sports, must be protected. I mean, there's just so much crap in here. Um, meanwhile, okay, here we go. Meanwhile, Israeli athletes who also do mandatory military service are blithely competing with no threats hanging over their heads. So because Israel has universal conscription, which I will point out is the norm in the majority of countries in the world, and it was a principle that the French Revolution brought to the modern nation state. Everyone has to serve. Before that, it was just the nobility and the lords who served. Um, it's very democratic in many respects. It just happens that the U.S. doesn't do this anymore, and neither does Britain, as far as I know. Um, every Israel is a military figure because they once served in the IDF, right? So by definition, every Israeli is a combatant. Right. Which way, is, that's not true of every Israeli. The Arab sector does not have to do military service. Yeah. Well, we all know when they say Israeli here, they mean Jew. I know what they mean, but that needs to be mentioned. Uh, you know, but uh, they, this is a common uh, thing that's thrown out. Uh, that, that's a, it's a very often mentioned about the mandatory conscription because uh, it helps to justify the civilians being a justifiable target yeah. by terror. Absolutely. Though That's the whole right. settler colonial thing seems to work very well for people who say 1948 was a European racist endeavor. Right. right. So you're a settler colonial list. You're a, you're, you're a legitimate target. All they do is they extract a few quotes from Franz uh, Fanon, the wretched of the earth. And hey, one of the greatest intellectuals of the 20th century says you guys are targets because you drove us to this position. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, it's not good. The countries have often excluded from the Olympics because of their involvement in war. After World War I, Belgium, the Olympic host of the 1920, did not want to invite geopolitical foes, Germany, Austria, Bulgaria, Hungary, and Turkey. Okay, I don't know what the end result was of that, but let me underscore here that that would have been wrong had they actually done it. We all know that Germany was unfairly blamed, as well as Austria, uh, and Hungary, absolutely, as well, for the war. Um, right. And the Treaty of Versailles unfairly punished Germany, which led ultimately to the rise of Adolf Hitler once the Depression hit. So, um, yeah, maybe Germany shouldn't have been treated the way they were and uh, they were unfairly targeted. And Belgium, well, Belgium was flattened by Germany during World War One, as we all know. That was the, one of the main battle sites. Um, Belgium, the whole Benelux countries really took a beating. Um, I, I'm not surprised that Belgium had an issue. France had an issue as well. They were out for blood. That doesn't mean it was the right decision to make. Then in 1948, after World War II, Olympic organizers in London did not invite Japan or Germany. Again, the IOC lodged its objections, though it yielded to the local organizing committee in the end. I don't know the upshot of the whole thing. I am rather surprised that, well, I mean, 1948, Germany was either still under occupation or there was formerly two Germanys. I don't know when um, it became official. But the U.S. and Britain went in right away to rehabilitate Western Germany. So this kind of uh, surprises me. I haven't looked into it enough to really know much about it. So the IOC as itself has banned countries um, under immense global pressure. It withdrew. So it's always South Africa. Always South Africa. It's the only example. Are there any have. other examples? Uh, to participate in summer uh, Tokyo. Afghanistan, I guess. Which? Afghanistan, yeah. Afghanistan under the Taliban. Okay, now if they're really comparing Israel to the Taliban, or even Russia for that matter, uh, then that's just, you know, off the charts insane, right? I mean, the Taliban enacted what I will call an apartheid state in Afghanistan, i.e., if you're a she, her, or hers, or probably a they, uh, uh, theirs or them, um, you would have been put under house arrest for all intents and purposes and forced to, uh, to shield your face. If you were a they, you would have been executed, of course. Um, that is apartheid. It's gender apartheid, which, as far as I'm concerned, is just as reprehensible as racial um, apartheid, perhaps even more so um, for uh, multiple reasons, given the sexual violence that, that women are subjected to. Um, so, yeah, no, these are not good examples here. You're taking the extreme of the extremes. And of course, South Africa apartheid is always the one that Israel is compared to, despite the vast differences between the two situations. How come they're not calling for a, a, a ban of China? 
They won't. Of course not. China got to host the Olympics a few years ago. Wasn't there a... Yeah, uh, Beijing, Beijing, yeah. They're yeah. not calling for a ban of, of Pakistan. Yeah. No, the big thing with China was when they didn't get the 2000 Olympics. I remember that actually happening. They were expected to get it. And I'm assuming it's because of their dictatorial regime that they were not chosen uh -huh. for that. But they did get the Olympics in the end. This uh -huh. isn't about Chinese participation. It's actually about hosting. Right. The Palestine Olympic Committee. Well, at least they have a committee. I mean, they haven't accused Israel of killing all the committee members. Mm -hmm. Is officially recognized by the IOC. But so far, recognition has not meant protection. What does that mean? Recognition has not meant protection. I have no idea. For the Palestinians or for the IOC committee? Are they on a hit list? I mean, if you're an IOC committee member and you're actually, uh, you know, holding terrorists and are a card-carrying member of Hamas, then your IOC uh, role is sort of irrelevant to the conversation. Is the implication here that once you're recognized, they have to be protected? By whom? There's no Olympic army. Who's going to protect you? I, I don't know. I, I, well, a country doesn't deserve protection because they're recognized as a legitimate Olympics participant. If that's the case, then Israel would be protected from inane diatribes like the one that I am reading here. All right. Uh, but, you know, yeah. Isn't the whole point of the Olympics uh, that all of the countries in the world can ignore what's going on politically, ignore their hostilities with one another, come together and compete? I was um, thinking about that very question as I was reading this. And, um, and again, I don't really watch the Olympics, but I do watch the opening ceremonies usually. Um, yes and no, it is. But at the same time, it is an attempt to show off nationalistic power. I mean, there is there is that element to it, right? Well, but you know, I don't understand why any any country would feel any great sense of of uh, nationalistic pride just because they have won a lot of medals at the Olympics. But they do. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, know that they do. I just that to me is it's very difficult to understand. I know it's stupid. I agree with you. I'm not a sports person. Um, but uh, I don't. Are you a sports fan? Did you, did you watch the Super Bowl this year? No, I'm not. A, I'm not into football. I do like baseball. Um, and I happen to say that I, I have to say that a few years ago when the Israel team Israel was was doing really well and beat Cuba in the World Baseball Classic, I got very excited about it. Right. OK, well, then you're being a Jewish nationalist. Do you see the connection? Yeah, I, I understand it. But I mean, in that in that case, you know, I was just very proud of the fact that Jews who are not normally thought of as being all that great at sports. They're, we're not known for our our athletic prowess. We're excelling at, at baseball. And the most of the players on the team were not even Israeli. They were Jewish Americans. Mm -hmm. They qualified for the team because they would be eligible for Israeli citizenship under the law of return. So, I mean, I, I was excited about it that year, but I honestly, uh, when it comes to the Olympics, I don't really care if the United States wins uh, medals. I don't I don't really care if Israel wins them. Baseball, I mean, is, a very, baseball is a very Jewish sport in certain respects. It is. I feel like the Jews gravitate to it. So to paraphrase Lenny Bruce, um, if you're into baseball, you're Jewish. If you're into football, you're Goyish. I, I think that's, that's a good that may, Yeah. Although the basketball is very popular at yeshivas. It is too. Yeah, I agree with you, basketball. Yeah. And I don't know why. And I enjoy watching a basketball game actually because there's a lot going on. But um, um, and, and it's rapid. Whereas football, there's really nothing happening, and people are just ramming into each other, and the fans are getting drunk and screaming. Um, all right. If the IOC allows Russian and Israeli athletes to compete in Paris, it will be an insult to Ukrainians and Palestinians who have lost family, friends, livelihood, and uh, it's a brutal invasion. Well, here's my comment here. Um, why should Palestinians be allowed then? It's an insult to Jews everywhere given October 7th. Isn't that legitimate? I mean, isn't this legitimizing October 7th? If, uh, if Israel needs to be punished and the Palestinians don't in the way that they're phrasing it here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, okay, so double standard. I mean, that's what they always do in all of these articles and these condemnations of Israel, all of these statements, all of it. They, they, they ignore October 7th. They ignore the actions of Hamas. They ignore the fact that Hamas has a few hundred uh, Israelis uh, kept in hostage. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we've already established that the authors are uh, believe in the uh, trope of Jewish supremacy. So, yes, um, and not just Jewish supremacy in Israel, in the West Bank, 
as a lot of scholars in Jewish studies will say today. They're actually saying that Israel controls the United States. With Kharkiv and Gaza under siege, that is not the immediate question, however. The pressing issue is solidarity with Ukraine and Palestine. It's about the principle that countries invading sovereign nations should have no place in the community of nations. It's about standing up to Russia and Israel. All right, so is Gaza a sovereign nation? Well, that's why I circled it. No, it is not. It is not. If it was a sovereign nation, if they believed in the ethno-national self-determination of the Gaza people, they would have declared the independent state of Gaza the minute Israel withdrew. But they didn't, because as far as they can, are concerned, Gaza is a work in progress. They are trying to take over the rest of what they call Palestine, and then they will have a sovereign state. So All right, uh, well, they don't get to call it that here then. No, of course not. You can't have it both ways. Either there's an independent, either there's a sovereign state called Gaza or there isn't. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they seem to want it both ways. Consistency. No, I just circled that because it's a bit of a joke. Um, <laughs> a looming genocide. Okay, they have to throw the genocide in. Has settled over Gaza with 25,000 dead, two thirds of whom are women. And when children. was this thing written? What's the date on this thing? Uh, good question. Let's see. It was in Jacobin. Uh, let me look up the actual article. Uh, Israel, Russia, Olympics. Uh, Israel and Russia have no place in the 24. It's published in Jacobin, which again is reason enough not to read it. 129, 2024. So quite recent. Was that before or after the ICJ ruling? Good question. I'm not sure. All right, because this was after ICJ has ruled that it's not a genocide. So they, they, why are they calling it a genocide here? Um, well, they don't say genocide. They say looming genocide. Well, but the ICJ has ruled that there's, it's not a looming genocide. That was the ruling. Basically. They actually said not a looming. They didn't say there's oh, no, a they, they, genocide. Well, they didn't. They didn't say that this is happening with genocidal intent. No, right, right. They've, they've kept the door open. Twenty six. The uh, ruling was twenty six of January. Okay. Well, they, if they've kept the door open to the possibility of genocide. Okay. Yeah. So now you're saying that this was this was after it was it was after after. Okay, but just a few days, right? Yeah. But, no, but that's not like, okay. So it, it could have been written before. It could have been written before the. Okay, but the, whatever. This is rendered moot by the following, you know, or irrelevant by the following right. statement: the planned displacement of two million people. Okay, how many? There's approximately two million people in Gaza. Is Israel planning to displace two million people? Well, yeah, kind of. There's there there that is a stronger possibility. How so? Well, because the infrastructure in Gaza is very, very depleted, and it's going to take a while to, to rebuild. So they may have to move almost 2 million people for a short period of time or some length of time. This is on the table. This is a possibility. Right. But when you see the word displacement in conjunction with genocide, displacement yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, means when you, ethnic cleansing. You know, I, I mean, sure. I, they they mean that they're going to be uh, ethnically cleansed from Gaza. That's what the authors here mean. But it is true that there could be a temporary temporary movement of these uh, these these uh, uh, Gazans. Right. OK. Well, it's then it's a very poorly worded sentence. But again, we've already established that they believe in Jewish supremacy. Um, I'm looking up Dave Zirin here. He's an American sports writer. No evidence that he's an academic in any way whatsoever. Who? Who? Dave Zirin, the second author. Uh, the Kaepernick effect. Taking a knee, changing the world. All right. Well, that's, that doesn't sound like, like something that uh, uh, is, uh, I, mean, I mean, who knows? I, I don't know. I don't know. The other guy's an academic who works on sports stuff and politics, which is a very legitimate academic field. We hosted a Sherman lecture a few years ago. We talked about race and sports, and it was a fantastic talk. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I think we're done with this. And yeah. we've proven that uh, sports historians have dipped their uh, feet into the waters, or sports scholars, I should say, of anti-Semitism. Um, it's disturbing that it's come from political scientists, because, you know, notwithstanding my... Uh, uh, very uh, low opinion of political science as a discipline. I have respected them for their rational views um, on global affairs.
So there's a compliment in there somewhere. The, yeah, there must be. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to turn off screen share because our third item doesn't require um, doesn't require a document. Yeah, Adam is going to take the lead on that one. So stop. Yeah. So. So yeah. So there is a new another story that that uh, involves sports. Uh, most of you uh, in the audience have probably heard about it, but um, there was a a a basketball tournament held in Latvia uh, a few days ago in Riga, and uh, it, it was originally supposed to be in Israel, and uh, because the Irish uh, basketball team didn't want to go to Israel during this uh, Gaza war. Uh, it, the game was moved to Latvia. Was it hosted by the Latvian Orthodox Church? Um, I don't know whether they wore those hats or not, right? I, the I, religionists I, of Boston and enigmatic. Aren't they the ones who mutilate squirrels? I don't know. You know more about that topic than oh I God. do. The, the Latvian oh, embassy oh. is going to be phoning us uh, in a couple of days from now. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, anyway, yeah, so the uh, the Irish, it was girls' basket. These were girls' basketball uh, teams. The, the, the Irish uh, basketball team uh, uh, refused to shake hands before the game with the Israeli uh, players, which is uh, very unsportsmanlike because that's the courteous and civil thing. Uh, it's also the traditional thing for uh, teams to do before a game starts, to shake hands and then uh, stand for the, uh, the national anthem. And I guess the uh, the Irish team refused to stand for the anthem as well during the uh, uh, when when that was when that went on. But what the Israeli team took incredible issue with was the fact that they wouldn't shake hands with them. Um, apparently, um, the Irish team uh, contemplated canceling the game entirely uh, because they didn't want to uh, match with Team Israel. But uh, they ultimately decided not to do that because they would have had to forfeit uh, a game, and uh, they want to win, obviously. So they went on with the so game. But racism is bad, but uh, winning at sports supersedes any uh, moral exactly. values that you have. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And then the uh, coach, or one of the coaches for the team Israel, um, referred to uh, the. Uh, Irish team is very anti-Semitic. It was something to that of a very anti-Semitic. And um, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Who said one of the coaches for Team Israel said that their action was anti-Semitic? No, that the that the Irish players are anti-Semitic. Did they say anything? Not the action, but the players are very anti-Semitic. How do they know that? I I think because they refuse to shake hands. Okay, so based on that, right? Based on that, yeah. Uh, and one of the, or a few of the uh, Israeli players said sim made similar comments. And the Irish uh, coaches uh, are livid. Uh, they, they felt that that was uh, uncalled for, that uh, this was a, a heinous accusation on uh, the Israelis' part to call them uh, anti-Semitic. I guess going back to the... Uh, big, you know, long-standing argument of whether or not, uh, you know, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Well, so if, you refuse to, if you refuse to shake hand with a Jew, um, I do say that that is anti-Semitic. Well, opinion. you know, uh, sure. Um, because, look, the these players are not representative of the Israeli government. They served in the IDF. They don't serve in the IDF. Oh, they don't. They're exactly. I don't think that they do. I, I'm not. I did not see that in any of the articles. Did you? No, but I'm just. I, I think that because what often happens in Israel is that athletes get deferments from the IDF okay. service. So that's probably what's happening here. Like they're all of age to serve, but uh, they're serving their country in sports rather than uh, in the IDF. It's either that or they're deferring their service till after their uh, athletic career is over. And Wait, then what sport? Oh, this is basketball. Basketball. So what? What league is this? Is the international? It's an international ba basketball league. Yeah. So, but I mean, 
you know, I, the argument that I could see uh, the apologists on the left making is that they are representatives of the state of Israel, and the state of Israel um, is, you know, quote, complicit in looming genocide and displacement of two million Palestinians. Right. Uh, that would be their argument, but um, you know, it's a it's a bad argument. That's no, terrible. No, it's the same as not inviting an academic to speak because they are funded by you know the University of uh, Jerusalem or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Exactly. Absolutely. No, you're blaming individuals um, because of the citizenship they happen to hold. It's like BDS. Yeah. Yeah. It is BDS. Yeah, it's BDS with a little bit of uh, um, hypocrisy because they didn't want to lose their place in the basketball league. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty pretty pathetic. Yeah. Very principled people, right? It's like, I'll boycott Israel until I need a product from that country, and then, you know, mm -hmm. we'll let it go. And from Israel's standpoint, too, they're used to, they're used to this. They're, they're used to having other countries refuse to compete with them. Or shake hands with them, or whatever. They're they refuse to being they're 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 used to being snubbed in sports by other countries. Now I'm not sure if if um, this has ever happened from an Irish team before. Usually when it happens, it's you know Arabic countries that yeah you know, absolutely yeah that that happens. You know if the Irish spent five minutes looking into it, they would look at the, and see the similarities in the shared history of persecution. Um, including an era of British colonialism of sorts and and immigration to the United States. The Jews basically took the place of the Irish um, that the Irish held in the U.S. as the not quite white people between 1840 and 1880. And once they were sort of grandfathered in, the Jews and other East Europeans came over and they assumed that rule and took a lot of the jobs that the Irish had. I don't think that they care. Of course not. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, you know, athletes don't usually learn history very well. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm surprised that they even care this much about the whole thing. I mean, I, the whole thing is, is oh. mind boggling, which makes me wonder if some of their coaches told them to, you know, go ahead and do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't know enough about it. So, but the game went ahead. Yeah, the game went ahead and Israel beat them by like 20 points. Oh, good. Okay. 87 to 57, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's the way it should be. 30 points. Oh, you know, we see these things unfolding in the uh, universe of sports. So it really appears that no sphere of life is off limits when it comes to targeting Israel for its uh, alleged crimes against Palestinians, which translates for them to alleged crimes against humanity. Mm -hmm. Even that's the language that they use. Mm -hmm. It's always analogized with South Africa and implicated with some sort of global control with the U.S. being led astray by the Jewish state. Mm -hmm. But you know the Israelis are used to it, and you know they they've got thick skin. They they've developed thick skin. Uh, they they've learned not to care. Well, Jews have developed thick skin over you know fifteen to eighteen hundred years of exile. I mean that's basically you know something they had to live with before. Well, it's been our sense of humor. That's that's uh, to quote Tim Watley. That is five thousand years. You know, five thousand years. Yeah. Ever since the creation of the world. Really, yeah. Jews. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Do we have anything else on this subject? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. No, yeah, no, the big story, of course, is that Sasha has Super Bowl fever, um, as we all know. And we that's, the big, to, that's the big story. All right. We want him to come and account for that on, on our show. But um, I think this was a, a great episode, slightly off topic, but at the same time, not really. We're just examining a different sphere where anti-Semitism is unfolding in the present world with Israel as a stand-in for the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. It happens to be the Jewish state, filled with Jewish people. Mm -hmm. um, all right. I think we are done. And I'll just make a plug. If you haven't watched it yet, um, please tune into our previous episode with Dr. Naya Lecht, who is an educator, an activist, and a thought leader. And uh, she is um, out there you know, doing the hard work of activism. And she made... The right, the, she made a smooth transition from academia to activism slash education, right? She definitely has created a great hybrid um, of the two that we academics, you know, haven't exactly, you know, done, even though we are in the activist realm ourselves. So please make sure you watch that. It is definitely worth your time. Right. And with that, this is Jared and Adam uh, signing off, signing mm -hmm. off sports fans. Play ball. Yeah. And may the Schwartz be with you. <laughs>